post under ratification. Let's see why this didn't post, guys. Hold on. I just forgot to hit post. That's why. So I just pushed this PowerPoint in here. This is um, it's a ratification of the Constitution PowerPoint. So this is what we're working on today. So you guys in here should be able to see it on the board. You guys at home, it should be shared to your computer screen. So talking about it now, we had all of these big things that were going on when you guys were with me last week. Um, how did the Constitution, what was going to have to happen? You guys remember the big argument was over uh, essentially the big states wanted more people in Congress proportional representation based on population while the little states wanted equality, right? Everybody should get the same thing. We ended up going with two houses, two, a bicameral. When I say bi, we're talking about two, like a bicycle has two wheels, a bicameral legislature where one is based on um, proportional representation and one is based on equality. That's why the house has more people in it. There's more state congressman from North Carolina than there is, say, Rhode Island, right? But we have the same amount of senators. So you had the Virginia plan and then the New Jersey plan and then the Great Compromise brought them all together. Y'all remember me talking about that last week? Well, there still has to be for us to get rid of the Articles of Confederation and to ratify or basically sign in to uh, the Constitution becoming the living and breathing document of the United States, it has to be ratified, which means most of the states had to basically agree to terms. And you have this faction that starts to grow against the, the Constitution. They're known as the Anti-Federalists, and they believe that too much power in the Constitution is given to the central government, the federal government, and they believe it's kind of becoming too much of a strong national government in the same way the monarchy was in England. They were called the anti-federalists. And then you have this group of federalists, when, meaning they want the strong central government. And they ultimately spend about two years between 1787 and 1789 arguing over why this is the living, breathing document, why this shouldn't be. And really what's going to end up coming to pass is the anti-federalists are going to get their way and they're going to work for a Bill of Rights to make sure that our um, our way of life is not challenged, that our civil liberties are not taken away by too strong of a government. So we'll talk about that today. Uh, how did Americans ratify the Constitution? What are the basic principles? That's all we're trying to get. So the Federalists are a group of people who favor a strong central government. They are George Washington. So George Washington is at the Constitutional Convention as the president of the convention. He doesn't become the president, guys, until we have the Constitution. Everybody got me? He's not that guy yet. He's the he's the American hero. Then the guy who's kind of running the show at the Constitutional Convention, I introduced him. He's considered the father of the Constitution is James Madison. And then there's this guy named Alexander Hamilton. Okay, y'all, when on Friday you watched that video on Hamilton. Hamilton is a... Uh, He's born in the Caribbean, but he's educated in New York. He's kind of Washington's right-hand man during the American Revolution, but he has seen trade and kind of commercialism and mercantilism and, and all, the, uh, all the interstate commerce really being the backbone of the economy. So he really wants a strong central government where they can regulate trade and make uh, – you know, make money off of other countries and so on and so on. So he's kind of the guy when you when I want you to think about the strong Federalists, I want you to think of Hamilton. Then another guy who's not listed right there is John Adams, who at this point is the ambassador to Great Britain. Now the anti-Federalist, John Hancock and Patrick Henry, they're fine. I really want you to know Jefferson. Okay. Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton become arch enemies over the early years of America because one of them believes, one of them is from the North, they favor, that's Hamilton, he believes in the strong central government trade, while Jefferson believes that America should be still strong state governments and a strong agrarian society. All right, when I say agrarian, we're talking about agriculture. All right, so Jefferson and Hamilton on opposite ends of it. Hamilton's the Federalist, Jefferson's the Anti-Federalist. 
So as we go down, what do the Federalists believe in? They stress the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Remember, we talked about all that. Couldn't tax, no interstate uh, commercialism, basically couldn't generate any federal revenue. There was no real the buck stops here type stuff with the Articles of Confederation. So the Federalists believe that we need a strong central government. Uh, and they're going to, what's going to happen, guys, this is where you start to see um, when we studied the American Revolution, the guy named Thomas Paine, who writes the, the article Common Sense or the pamphlet Common Sense that goes around and it basically says, you know, it makes no sense for us to be um, behooven to a island across the sea. That makes no sense. Well, that's the use of media being infiltrated into American lives. Well, Hamilton and Madison and John Jay, they published this series of essays called the Federalist Papers. All right? And these Federalist Papers are essays, and a lot of times they're written by these guys, but they're written with pen names. You don't know what pen names are, not their real name. And they're circulating all throughout these newspapers, basically like, this is what's going on. This is why we need a strong central government. And they're trying to change the ideas and the opinions of everyone throughout the colonies to push everybody to vote for ratification. All right. They proposed the Constitution could remedy the weakness. But then you have the anti-federalists who are scared that all of these things that they end up fighting for are just going to be abused if we get too strong of a, of a central government. So they fear the loss of liberties and they don't like the fact that originally in the Constitution there is no Bill of Rights. I'm okay with a strong central government if you give me a bill of rights. You understand me? Make sure that the federal government does not abuse what is mine. So they feared a concentration of power in a distant elite, believing instead that power should remain democratically elected. State governments, guys, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson. This is where you've got to be able to distinguish the two farmers particularly Southern farmers, a lot of times were anti-federalists. Uh, they feared the Constitution threatened state debtor relief laws that rescued many from foreclosure. Farmers also distrusted lawyers, merchants, wealthy, and people who lived in cities in general. Uh, so when I draw, if I drew something up, anti-federalists, rural or Southern, federalists, they get support in the cities and really in the Northeast. You need to know that. The two most trusted Americans at that time period are George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. They know we can't survive with the Articles of Confederation. It's not any good. Frontiersmen, all of this has already been discussed at the Constitutional Convention. Okay, now we're just deciding whether or not we want to ratify it. Frontiersmen, people in the West or rural, felt a stronger government provided protection against Native Americans and the British in the Northwest. So there are some good things and artisans, traders in cities and most newspapers supported ratification as well. So you have the Federalist Papers. Madison argued that a strong national government and the Constitution's checks and balances would strengthen liberty. Hamilton wrote the importance of a judicial branch to protect this liberty. Federalists pushed for fast approval. So while the Constitutional Convention happened in 1787, five states had ratified, but you need nine states, okay? Federalists gained the support of Massachusetts Governor John Hancock by hinting he may be picked at the, as the first vice president. When the Federalists agreed to add a Bill of Rights, four more states quickly ratified, including your home state, guys. North Carolina would not have ratified the Constitution had there not been a version that said, I protect Brianna from the fact that we're never going to make American soldiers live with her in the same way that the British made people live with people in Boston with the Quartering Act. Uh, or you're not going to be thrown in jail for having a difference of opinion than the president or your congressman. Uh, North Carolina really, really fought hard for the Bill of Rights. So Congress convened in New York's Federal Hall. And as you guys know, guys, I'm not insulting my intelligence. When we, when we do ratify the Constitution, we have the three branches of government like we talked about, but you also end up having the Bill of Rights, which is why they're called the first 10 amendments. They were not originally in the Constitution, right? They were amended 
So they get ratified as well. And then we have to elect a president and a vice president. So we elect George Washington, who was the president of the Constitutional Convention. Washington was actually elected unanimously. OK, nobody got an electoral vote from him the first two elections. Everybody good on that? And then John Adams will be his vice president. We add the Bill of Rights. Uh, the last two states, Rhode Island and North Carolina, now reconsidered earlier rejections and ratified as well, bringing the total of 13 states. So all 13 states. Now, quickly, you guys should know this from uh, civics. Go quickly go over the Bill of Rights. Number one, freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. All right. Number two, right to bear arms in order to maintain a re well-regulated militia. Been discussed for centuries, guys. Does this mean I get to have my own assault rifles? Who knows? Depends on how you interpret the, the law. No quartering of soldiers like we just talked about, meaning I can't, no matter how dire the circumstance, I can't put an American soldier to live with Caitlin and her family. All right. That had happened. The British had done that to us. Freedom of unreasonable searches or seizures. They can't go in your car or your house without a, what do you call that word? A warrant. There you go. Due process, freedom of self-incrimination. Basically, you have the right to remain silent. Uh, double jeopardy can't be tried of the same crime twice. Right to accused persons, right to a speedy and public trial, right to trial by jury in civil cases, freedom of excessive bail, cruel and unusual punishment other rights of the people and powers reserved to the state. That 10th one, guys, is really important as we go through class. Basically, guys, because at this point, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments weren't added until after the Civil War. Okay, so when we say powers reserved to the states, never in that, consti in that Constitution does it talk about slavery other than the fact that African Americans were counted as three-fifths of people in terms of population for state legislatures, right? So basically, the states had a right to decide whether or not slavery was going to be outlawed or not. And that's not going to change until the, the, the uh, 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment. Constitution established a representative government based on six principles. The people are the only source of the government's power, popular sovereignty. You elect local local officials, limited government. The government only has the powers that the Constitution gives it. That's why we call this the 10th Amendment powers reserved to the states. If it ain't in that constitution, that law belongs to state and local governments. Everybody with me? Separation of powers. Power is divided amongst the three branches of government. Federalism, the federal and state governments share power. If there's hap there can be no conflict because if there is, the federal government ends up being the supreme power of checks and balances. We've gone over it in a representative government. Citizens elect representatives of government to make laws. So there's your kind of civics review and your history lesson of what happened uh, during this entire time period. So we're going to take a little bit broader picture view. Let me stop recording here.